welcome. First of all, welcome. This is Unsolicited Perspectives. I'm Bruce Anthony, your host, here to lead you in the conversation about important events and social issues that are shaping society. Join the conversation by following us wherever you get your audio podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Rate, review, like, comment, share. Share with friends, family, hell, even your enemies. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about Thanksgiving and family and capitalism and Generation Z. But that's enough of this intro. Let's get to the show. Well, we are back from the Thanksgiving break. And Thanksgiving is a important time of year to spend time with your family. I personally didn't spend time with my family, but we conversated and we talked. Um, But I wanted to talk about family. My parents had me at a very, very young age. On the day of my birth, my mom had just turned 23 the day before. My dad was 21. Young, young parents. Before the age of 30, they had already had four kids. Uh, That's a hell of a time to grow up because your 20s and 30s, you're growing up yourself and raise a family. It's safe to say that uh, my parents were not perfect, though I think they were better than most. Uh, some They made mistakes, some of which they know about, some of which we don't know about, and that me and my brother and sister are finding out more in therapy. The, the larger point I'm trying to make is, is that we can look at family, whether it's our parents, you know, aunts, uncles, siblings, cousins, things of that nature. We can look at those people, friends, we can look at the people that we love and recognize that they have faults, right? That doesn't take away the fact that we love them. We understand that people that we love still have flaws. We can acknowledge those flaws, and that doesn't take away from our love for them, nor does it question our love for them. My mom and dad know that even though I have called them out on some of their flaws and they're up on the way that they raised me, my brother and sister, that I love them with all of my heart. I have friends, friends that I've had for decades that I absolutely love and adore. I will still call them out on their flaws. That doesn't mean that I don't love them. I'm saying all this to lead to a much larger point. It's funny to me how we can call out those that we love, understand that they're flawed, understand that they are not always right and that they make mistakes and that they may do things that hurt us. Sometimes it's on purpose. Sometimes it's not on purpose. We can acknowledge all those things and our love for them by and large isn't questioned by other people. People are not walking up to me and saying, hey, you know, you're saying that your mom and dad made some mistakes when raising you. You don't love your parents. Nobody says that. Nobody says that. If nobody is questioning our love for our loved ones when we call them out on their flaws, why is it when we call out our country, our patriotism is questioned? Oh, yeah, there was a plot twist. You thought I was going to talk about family this entire episode, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about the hypocrisy of which we can look at people that we love, cherish, call them out on their flaws. The love for them is never questioned. But if we call out our country for their flaws, our love of the country is questioned. Now, anybody that's done any history of this country will recognize this country has made a tremendous amount of mistakes. One of those such mistakes was heavily featured This past weekend, if you want to pay attention to it, in our celebration of Thanksgiving. Now, throughout history classes that even I was taught, it was told to us that pilgrims, and they were called Indians at the time, we call them indigenous uh, indigenous people now, um, shared this great buffet on Thanksgiving. And everything was hunky-dory and there was never any issues. Mm, That's partly the truth. But that's not the complete truth. Like much things in this country's history, it's becoming whitewashed. Yeah, slavery was a thing that happened, but it's becoming whitewashed. All of a sudden, 
slaves were given skills that helped them when they weren't slaves anymore. This completely pushes aside the fact that slaves had these skills before they were in slavery. They weren't taught these things. So, but that's another subject. We're not going to get into that. What we're going to talk about specifically is the history as described to us growing up here in this country when it comes to indigenous people, Indians for this conversation, because Indians were the words that were used when we were brought up and taught this history lesson. I read a very, very interesting article this weekend. It was in the USA Today. And it was, uh, the, the title of the article was The Pilgrims Didn't Invite Native Americans to a Feast, Why Thanksgiving Myth Matters by Kinsley Crowley. And I thought that it was really important for me to come on this show uh, and not disparage Thanksgiving. The idea of the holiday, giving thanks to those that we love is, is a good thing. And if something good can turn from something bad, I'm always for that. And and Thanksgiving, by and large, has turned into something good from something that was bad, and bad being the treatment of indigenous folks here in this country. So I'm not bashing Thanksgiving. I celebrate Thanksgiving. I give thanks to all those people that I love. That's the meaning that I take from Thanksgiving now. But the start of it, we have to acknowledge, is a little faulty. So in this article, it acknowledges the uh, the article challenges all of the traditional Thanksgiving narrative of it's this great time where pilgrims and Indians were together celebrating this big feast. And it really, the article really delves into the idea that pilgrims invited Native Americans, Indians, and, and, and uh, insidious, uh, not insidious, uh, Native Americans to this feast which wasn't the case. So um, in the article, uh, Paula Peters, who is a member of the, I'm going to butcher this, Mashapee uh, Win, Wampanag tribe, um, and an independent scholar. She's highlighted in this article. And she talks about the history that's been passed down in this tribe, because this tribe has been in the Massachusetts, Rhode Island area for 12,000 years. And, and she says that the idea that uh, pilgrims had invited uh, this particular tribe to this grand feast uh, is not completely true. What was happening was, is that uh, the pilgrims were celebrating um, a great harvest and decided to have a feast. Mind you, this feast wasn't the things that we traditionally eat with the turkey and the stuffing and the candy yams and macaroni and cheese and, and the collard greens. By the way, if you ain't eating all that stuff, then you ain't having real Thanksgiving. And I will add into this, uh, Italian Thanksgiving, fantastic, because they add some lasagna, some medical, like this is, it's, all these things is delicious. But she says that uh, during this big celebration and feast that the pilgrims were having, they were bucking off shots. They were shooting their guns in celebration, kind of like a precursor to fireworks, maybe. This sparked up interest from the local tribe who signaled, who thought that was a signal of a threat. So they rounded up their crew, about 90 folks, and went to go see what all this ruckus was. What they found were a bunch of pilgrims sitting down having a feast. In the process of this confrontation that really didn't turn violent, but it was you know, started out as, hey, what the hell is this going on over here? The pilgrims invited this particular tribe to come and have food with them and eat up. And this is the story of Thanksgiving, the true story of Thanksgiving. So Paula Peters goes on to point out that, you know, as in most whitewashing of history, as in the clear example that I said with slavery, that, uh, Slave masters taught slaves certain skills that carried on for them. This this was not true. Another narrative that is often pointed out is that are that pilgrims taught Native Americans certain things that helped them progress in life. And the article points out, and Paula Peters points out, this is not true. Native Americans taught a lot of pilgrims how to grow certain crops and 
fruits and vegetables, how to how to farm, how to hunt, because these things, because pilgrims came here not knowing the terrain. So a lot of the stuff that's been passed down that that people have said pilgrims were the ones that created this were really just things that pilgrims were taught by Native Americans in these several different tribes all over the places. Were there tribes that that were aggressive? Yes, there were tribes that were aggressive. I guess anybody would be aggressive if you're coming to take what is theirs. Let me ask you a question by a show of hands. If you're listening to this audio, if you're watching it on YouTube, raise your hand if you would not defend your home if an intruder walked in to try and take stuff. I think that's a natural human thing to want to defend what is yours. And the idea that somebody could just come and take it would be kind of, you know, something that would get your blood boiling a little bit. And so if you see people coming in and taking what's yours, and maybe they took it, you're going to go, you know, get what you need to get and then go back and try and take back what was yours. So this idea that Native Americans were these aggressive, aggressive people and that pilgrims were or the people of of this time period that was populating this area were these innocent bystanders that were minding their own business and being attacked. It's just not true. Were there instances of that? Absolutely. But are we not taught the instances where these pilgrims were absolutely the aggressors? Once again, it was a whitewash in the history. And I say all of this, and I bring up all of this, not to, not to disparage America, but to call out the truth about America's past. That's, that's all I'm doing. Me calling out the truth of America's past, just like me calling out the truth of mistakes that my parents may have made, or the truth that you'll call out your parents or your loved ones, your friends, your significant others for the mistakes that they made, doesn't mean that you don't love them. Me calling out the atrocities that this country has done doesn't mean that I don't love this country. I was reading another article and I can't remember the name of this article, but the, the but it's not something that that we don't already know about. You you're hearing whispers of a, a, maybe a draft coming back out for our armed forces because the numbers of enrollment are dwindling, and they're finding out the younger generation just isn't willing to go fight for their country. Um, especially during wartime. Obviously, there are different instances where this country has been attacked, whether it be Pearl Harbor, uh, September 11th, uh, things of that nature, where the country responds around that and enlistment uh, grows. Obviously, people are willing to to fight for this for this country, fight for the freedoms. That's that's not the thing. What most people are not doing is enrolling into the armed forces. And and they're trying to develop this correlation with people just don't love this country. And it's like, no, I don't, I don't believe that that's the case. I believe people are tired of being lied to. Let me give you an analogy. If you're a child and you're growing up and your parents say, uh, if you do this, this will happen. Here's one. <laughs> this is a bad one, but this is one. If you have unprotected sex, you're you're going to get somebody pregnant. Well, I mean, part of that is true, right? Like that's how you get pregnant by having unprotected sex. Sometimes even have protected sex, you still get get people pregnant. But ha- the the odds are more likely of getting somebody pregnant if you're having unprotected sex. This is absolutely true. But does that mean that every time that you have unprotected sex, you're going to get somebody pregnant? No. So it's a truth and a lie. Right. And if your parents are telling you this and you find out, well, that's a truth, but a lie. This isn't like it's you're doing semantics here. You might not trust everything that your parents tell you because you know that they're not being 100 percent truthful. And there's a little bit of deception in what they're telling you. There would be a lack of trust. Conversely. If you're taught. In your history courses, that America is a certain way, 
And as you get older and you read more or you get into college and you find out more information, you find out that, well, America isn't exactly the way that you told told me it was. You would have maybe a little bit less faith in what your country is telling you. So maybe you're a little less likely to stand up and until until it's needed, right? You might let the country take a couple of right and left before you jump in the right, jump in the fight, only because you realize that hey, some of the things that this country has been telling me isn't necessarily all the way truthful. They're omitting certain things on purpose to make themselves look better. And don't get me wrong, the ideals of this country are pretty much what we should aspire to across the world. Every vote should matter. Every voice, well, not all voices should be heard, but but voices should be heard. The masses should be heard. We should work towards uh, commonality and, and start from there when trying to create laws and policy. Um, these are things that's, that's democracy. Uh, these are things that we obviously should work towards in the founding fathers for a lot of flaws that they have. Despite the fact that they were racist, misogynist, and all that, the the under underlining principle of this country, the foundation of this country, ideology wise, as far as democracy, let me let me make that clear. As far as democracy, was right. They had it right not to create a monarch, to create a, a democracy, not to have one supreme person. They they were right. Now. Did they mess up on a lot of things? Yeah, they messed up on a lot of things. A lot of things they can't foresee because you can't foresee the future. Um, but yes, the idea of this country is fantastic. Are we the greatest country in the world? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know that to be the case. I do know that we often try to gloss over the bad stuff of our past and only look at the good stuff of our past. And Thanksgiving is a prime example. Did you know that most Native Americans uh, describe Thanksgiving as a day of mourning? I mean, just th think about it. I don't live in an area where there is a lot of Native Americans, but this is what I can tell you. I live in the Washington, D.C. area where our professional football team was a slur to Native Americans that finally wasn't changed until a couple of years ago. I'm talking about the pandemic, right? That a lot of baseball teams and college uh, teams, mascots are derogatory towards Native Americans. Now, if you're praising a tribe like Florida State Seminoles, that's cool. But the Cleveland Indians? I won't even repeat the, the the former Washington football team's name because that's such a slur that it, it it's it's not quite the N-word, but it ain't that far off. And I often got into arguments living in the DC area with black folks who love that Washington football team and will wear that emblem all on their chest and and say the name. And I still correct people right now to this day who still say the former name. And I say, hold up, man, wait up. Why is it okay for you to say that when you wouldn't want a white person to call you the N-word? Well, that's not quite the same. I, I'm not going to go on what's worse. They're both bad. And you know it's bad. You know it's wrong. Well, some of them don't mind. I Some of them speak for all of them. Like, you know in your heart that this is bad. Me as a black man, this is the reason why I get on this podcast and I talk about marginalized groups, whether it's us as black folks, whether it's Latino folks whether it's the Jewish community, whether it's uh, uh, people that uh, follow Islam as a faith, uh, whether it's the LGBTQ plus community, anybody that's a marginalized group, I'm always going to be on their side because me as a marginalized person would want you to understand that when I talk about my trauma, my pain, I want you to appreciate what I'm saying, not have understanding, but have empathy. So I, of course, am going to have empathy and try, even though I probably can't try to have understanding for any marginalized group for what they tell me that they're going through. I couldn't understand how so many black people in this area couldn't understand how wrong that was. And they did. They understood how wrong it was. They just didn't want to take away their feel good. And I almost get it.
I used to love R. Kelly music. Let me be honest. I still love R. Kelly music. I won't listen to it, but for two songs, two songs, I still can't give up. R. Kelly is an animal. What he did to those young women, he was an absolute animal. I'm also going to call out my hypocrisy because I knew in the early 2000s, because I had seen the videotape, exactly what he did. And I ignored it because I enjoyed his music. And it wasn't until that documentary was shoved in my face and I had no choice but to acknowledge it and say, I cannot condone what he did. I must condemn it. I cannot support him anymore. I have to call myself out on my own hypocrisy. I have to do it. Even if it's taking away my feel good. So people don't want to change the names of their sports team because it takes away their feel good. I partly understand it. I, I'm not partly. I, I get where they're coming from. I do. I get where they're coming from. I also get where people are coming from when they don't want to acknowledge America's atrocities. I get it. You love your country. I also get the fact that you don't want to acknowledge that your mother, your father, your aunt, your uncle, your sibling, your friends are at fault and have done things that were mistakes and have wronged you. I get it. But just because you acknowledge all those things does not mean that you don't love it. Acknowledging the truth means that you love that person or thing even more. Because despite all of their bad stuff, you still love it. Black people have every right. Native Americans have every right. Jewish Americans, the LGBTQ plus community, any marginalized group has every right to hate America because America hasn't really loved them back. It's an abusive relationship. Have you ever been in an abusive relationship? Have you ever loved somebody or something and it just didn't love you back? It just didn't treat you nice? Every time it got a chance to, it stepped on your throat, kicked you in your butt. Have you, have you had that? That's what it's like being a marginalized group in this country. But every person in those marginalized groups still have love for this country. So what is the entire point? Celebrate Thanksgiving. Be thankful for your friends and your family. Flip it, right? It starts out as a bad thing. We basically decimated Native Americans in this country. Right? Basically decimated. And before you go and say, well, we gave them reservations, look at the land. Look at the land that we gave them. It really wasn't great. Great land, right? Like, we didn't give them much to, to try and build on. Th that's the truth, okay? Native Americans still love this country. Native Americans are still trying to bring people together to understand this truth and significance of Thanksgiving. It can absolutely be a day of mourning, and we should absolutely recognize all those that have lost their lives for generations while this holiday has been disguised as a good thing. But also, we could take from that, take the day of mourning, and also give thanks. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging both of them. We don't have to be binary. We don't, things don't always have to be black and white. Life is shades of gray. And I get it. Some of you guys that listen to this, you either enjoy my shades of gray or you hate my shades of gray. Some of y'all out there are hate listening and hate watching. And that's okay. I'm, I'm all right with that. You know, if you get a little bit from what I'm trying to say here, or trying to do here, fantastic. That's all I'm trying to get a get across. I don't have this hubris to believe that I'm always right either. I listen to different opinions and I really take them into counsel because I'm always willing to learn something new and I have no problem acknowledging when I'm wrong. And it's not like you've got to jump down my throat and prove how wrong I am. Like I, I'm always open to discussion. Life for me is shades of gray. Do I wish everybody thought like me? No, I don't wish that everybody thought like me. If everybody thought like me, how do I learn? How do you grow? That's the reason why it's important to reach across the aisle to recognize people that think differently than you and talk to them and have really intelligent, productive conversations. And realize that just because they're in disagreement with you, just because they say 
You know, America has done some stuff that's really shitty. That doesn't mean that they don't love America. Just ask when you say that your mother, father, brother, sister, friend, cousin, whoever has wronged you and done something wrong. That doesn't mean that you don't love them. You can have love and truth at the same time. Hey there, podcast listeners. It's Bruce Anthony here, and welcome to another episode of Unsolicited Perspectives. Today, I want to talk to you about something that's been on my mind lately, the importance of staying hydrated and taking care of ourselves. Whether it's prioritizing our health and wellness, or gearing up for festival seasons, or just gearing up for whatever season or time of year, there's one brand that's been my go-to for all things hydration, Liquid IV. Speaking of health and wellness, let's dive into how Liquid IV can fuel your well-being. Imagine starting your day off right, feeling refreshed and energized. Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier is the missing piece in your daily routine. With just one stick, you get five essential vitamins and two times faster hydration than water alone. It's perfect for those early mornings, pre-workout boosts, moments when you're just feeling run down, or even after a late night or long flights. I absolutely love how convenient Liquid IV is. The packaging makes it easy to bring with me wherever I go. And let me tell you, it's become vital daily part of my routine. The flavors, <laughs> let me tell you something, they're incredible. From refreshing sea berry and strawberry lemonade to classics like lemon lime and watermelon, there's a flavor for every preference. It's like a burst of hydration with a hint of deliciousness. Picture this. One stick of liquid IV mixed in 16 ounces of water, hydrating you two times faster and more efficient than water alone. And with 12 mouth water and flavors, you'll never get bored with your hydration routine. Plus, liquid IV is packed with five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and of course, vitamin C. It's also made with premium ingredients, non-GMO, free of gluten, dairy, and soy. This is hydration at its finest, but it doesn't stop there. Liquid IV believes that access to clean and abundant water is the foundation of a healthier world. That's why they partner with leading organizations finding innovative solutions to help communities protect both their water and their futures. It's incredible to know that Liquid IV has already donated over 39 million servings in 50 plus countries around the world. They truly walk the talk. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code unsolicited at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code unsolicited at liquidiv.com. Remember folks, taking care of ourselves should always be a priority. So why wait? Head over to liquidiv.com, pick your favorite flavors and experience hydration like never before. Stay refreshed, stay hydrated, and keep rocking those unsolicited perspectives. Capitalism. What is the actual definition of capitalism? The definition of capitalism is an economic and political system in which the country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit. A free market? Capitalism. It's kind of what... I mean, this country is based off of capitalism, but the government does control uh, certain things as far as our economy is controlled and, and certain markets and things of that nature. And they regulate certain things so things don't get out of control. I, I was thinking about this recently because I have a friend who's 45 and I have another friend who's in their 20s and they're both gig workers. So they're both independent contractors run their own self-employed type of thing, right? Not the, not the typical nine to five. And what capitalism is about, free market enterprise, right? Entrepreneurship. That's what this country is, is based off. And, and they're both kind of finding it difficult to navigate in this economy because capitalism is good and bad. What tends to happen in capitalism is the wealth, the wealthy in this country tend to hold on to the money. This whole idea, I remember when Ronald Reagan came down with trickle down economics, that the, that the rich that had the money, the money will trickle down to the middle class and lower middle class. And, and the lower class and, and 
we will get ourselves out of poverty because that's how it works. And that was total BS. Like when you have money, you hold on to money. That's the only way to become a billionaire in this country is to hold on to your money. You can't become a billionaire and keep spending money or giving away money. Like that's, that's not how that works. You accumulate as much money as you can in order to be a billionaire. So the idea that money would trickle down to the lower classes just is not going to happen. Different presidents have tried different things, whether it be tax cuts for middle class or income tax credit earned, things of that nature to put money back in the pockets, different tax rates for, you know, different people that earn a different standard of living. But part of the problem is, is that the cost of living has gone up and wages have kind of, you know, stayed stagnant. I mean, the fact that minimum wage and, and I was arguing with somebody the other day. They said, well, it's a $15, $15 minimum wage. I was like, no, certain states have a $15 minimum wage, which, by the way, is still below the poverty line. I was reading an article that said people would need to make at least $25 an hour to be able to support a family. And guess what? Even in certain places in this country, you're still going to be below the poverty line. I live in the Washington, D.C. area. We call it the DMV. All right. And I know Washington, D.C. people really don't like that. Uh, The people that actually live in the city limits. But we call it the DMV. It's the District, Maryland and Virginia. This is this area, uh, depending on who you talk to, which county and which state gets included in this area. And and this PG County always says that that we are the, the real part of the DMV. Montgomery County, Maryland claims a DMV as well. And I would say wherever the DMV is, is where the metro stretches. That's that that to me is a DMV. That is the clear indicator of what the DMV is. And let me explain something to you about how expensive it is to live in this area. You can't find yourself a decent one bedroom apartment under two thousand dollars. Not if you want to be anywhere close to where anything is going on. Can you move further north and further south? Of course, you can move out of the areas of where the metro can reach and you can find cheaper apartments. But there's nothing there. Right. There's nothing there. So. In order to live in the DMV that's close to the district, right? You're not going to get a one bedroom apartment that's more, that's less than a good, a good bedroom apartment in a decent area that has decent amenities. Can you find a one bedroom apartment under 10 grand in a decent area? Yeah, but guess what? You might have some roaches. You might have some mice because those buildings were tend, tend to be built a long time ago. So they're older which means that it's easier for rodents to get in. I mean, that's just the truth. And I, I don't know about you. I don't want to live near roaches and mice. Like that's that's not a thing I want to be a part of. So most one bedrooms and one bathrooms are going to be about two grand a month. And and you're not going to get a lot of space. You're not going to get a lot of space. You know, one bedrooms can start at like 520 square feet. 520 square feet isn't enough for me to stick out my arms and do a twist, right? It's not a lot of space. And you're telling me that's two grand? And that old idea that you're only supposed to spend a quarter of your income on rent or mortgage of that nature, let's let's think about that. Let's say it's a quarter. That means you'd be taking home $8,000 a month. If you're taking home $8,000 a month, then that is roughly $96,000 a year, which means that you're probably making $150,000 a year. And guess what? That's the median income in the area that I live. That's, that's basically, you have to make that in order to live where I live or else you're struggling. And so I was reading this article. The article is called The Goose That The Goose Lays More Golden Eggs Every Year. Warren Buffett explains why capitalism doesn't work for young people today in a simple way he would solve it. And this is by Sarah Lewis, and it is from uh, moneywise.com. And he points out, this article points out the challenges for young Americans, that many young Americans are less likely to benefit from the U.S. market system compared to their parents. Now, I will tell you, uh, my parents aren't necessarily boomers. Um, they probably, I'm a millennial. They're probably Gen X. They're at the tail end. They're at the top end of Gen X, not not close to me. My my mom has siblings that are like eight years older than me. So we're there right, right on the line of Gen X and millennials. I think they're Gen X. I'm a millennial um, or whatever it's called now. Okay. I know when my parents bought their very first home, 
It was in Lynchburg, Virginia. It was in 1993. They bought this home for $80,000. Now, I know what you're thinking to yourself. $80,000 home, it must have been small. No, it was not small. I want to say it was at least 2,000 square feet, um, four bedrooms, two and a half baths, uh, backyard, deck. This was going to come up. We had pillars in our front yard. Um, We had the biggest house on the block, $80,000. Now, uh, everybody go back and listen to the interview that I had with Will Wired. He's a real estate, I'm going to say expert. I talked to him a lot about real estate. And there are a bunch of different loans and stuff like that, FHA loans, where you don't need to have 20% down. But think about it. Old school loans, 20% would have been $16,000 for my parents taking that 80, 80 grand, right? Like, not to say the $16,000 is not hard to attain now to save up. But it's a hell of a lot easier now than it was then. But there are no places that you can get for $80,000. There are condos that are one bedroom, one bath in the area that I'm living at that are no less than $300,000. One bedroom, one bath, condos for $300,000. Once again, can you get cheaper if you move, if you go further north into Maryland or further south in Virginia? Yes, but you're not near anything, Right. You might not be near your work. If you work in D.C., that's a hell of a commute to get to work. Right. So the idea and I was I remember talking to my dad about this, about, you know, I don't understand how you and mom struggled because the the mortgage was so cheap. The mortgage was like six hundred dollars a month. He was like, son, first of all, we wasn't making that much money. And he's like, you make double what me and your mom was making combined. Okay, during that time. That's number one. Number two, yeah, we were able to save a little bit more money because we didn't have expenses like you had. Think about it. In 1993, there were no cell phones. I mean, there were cell phones, but not everybody had cell phones. You had your house phone, right? Uh, Cable was a thing, but it wasn't cable and internet. My parents were not paying uh, $100 to $200 for cable and internet. Gas was cheaper, right? Food was cheaper. Things were just cheaper. Uh, Inflation is a real thing. The cost of goods have absolutely come up. And this younger generation, I I fear for them because I know what my college tuition cost. And I also know my cousins who are 15 years behind me, how much they paid. Going to the same school was more. It was a lot more than what I paid going to the same university. Right. The University of Maryland, the cost of going to the University of Maryland in 1998 is completely different than the cost of going to the University of Maryland in 2010. Completely different. It's a different ball game. So if you're taking out student loans, which everybody really much pretty much has to your student loans are more than what my student loans were. So they're already in a bigger debt than even I was 15 years before them. Right. So the younger generation is really struggling. I think about when my parents built their house. They built their house in 2001, 2001, 2002. I don't know the exact numbers, but it was probably like 300,000, 350,000 maybe. Once again, I explained to you people out there, a one bedroom, one bath condo in my neighborhood goes for $300,000. That's in 20 years, 20 years. And that house that my parents built, like 4,000 square feet, three levels. It was huge. It was called the mini mansion. It was huge. So the the cost of everything has skyrocketed. And Warren Buffett points out something in this article that's that's really, really interesting. Uh, He says uh, about 60% of young adults in 2022 express a negative view of capitalism. And part of the reason why they express a negative view of capitalism is because capitalism in the economy isn't really working with them. And Warren Buffett suggests that the economy system may not work for young people due to increased specialization, creating a wider wage gap. What does that mean? So um, I remember when I was coming up uh, and I was in high school, I was one of those last generations in high school that actually had these things. And it was in my high school in Lynchburg, Virginia. I guarantee you. 
I know for a fact it was not a thing when I moved up to the Washington, D.C. area one year from my sophomore year in uh, 1995 to my junior year in 1996. I moved from Lynchburg, Virginia to Washington, D.C. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm 43 years old. OK, I moved from uh, Lynchburg, Virginia to Washington, D.C. Lynchburg, Virginia was the last high school that I had seen because I did not see this in Washington, D.C. that had programs that you had heard about like auto programs. Right. It was the last pro- it was the only program left. But there used to be a time in high schools where not everybody was going to college. So you could learn a trade in high school. It was the last one. I was I had the last high school that did auto mechanics. Right. But there used to be a thing for electricians, for plumbers, all that type of stuff. Then that became DeVry. We're serious about success. And they stopped putting it in the public schools and took it out of the public schools. And then you had to start paying for it. Well, now we have a problem in this country because a lot of those skilled workers, plumbers and things of that nature, auto mechanics, we don't have as many of them as we used to. So the cost of services for those services have gone up, right? If you have a fewer amount of people that can actually do a service, then that cost of that service goes up. When he talk, when Warren Buffett talks about specializing, like when I was in college, coding was becoming a big thing. My dad told me, hey, you love computers. You should get into coding. I was like, no, I went to school. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to help the youth. Did I ever teach? I stepped foot in that classroom, stepped out of that classroom. I wasn't cut out for it. Guess what I do now? I do a lot of coding. I do a lot of coding. It's a specialized thing. So these the ideas that people could could own, earn a living without specializing in something is gone, right? And now those people that specialize in something are the ones that are getting the jobs that are paying higher rates that create this wage gap that we currently have. And now coding isn't that big of a deal because right down the road for me, there's a kitty coding school, kitty coding school where little kids can learn how to code five, six, seven years old. It's not a specialized skill anymore. AI creation is kind of like a specialized skill, but it, in a certain generation, it won't be specialized anymore. So that's what's creating this uh, this wage gap. Uh, Warren Buffett argues that you know he's still a proponent for capitalism, but that some adjustments need to be made to accommodate people and distribute wealth more broadly. Uh, he brings up the fact that this is very, very important. Uh, he 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 brings up that adjustments in wealth, the golden age being distributed, um, is the most important thing. So money being distributed is very important. Um, highlighting that the concentration of wealth is in the top 10% of households in this country. All of the wealth is in 10% of the households in this country. The top 10% of household hold 69% of America's total household wealth, while the bottom 50% hold 2.5% of America's household wealth. Let me explain that to you again. If you got a hundred people, now if you got a hundred dollars, I don't know how to do the math on this. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, I got it. If you got a hundred dollars, ten people are going to have sixty nine dollars, right? I think I, I think I did this right. No, I didn't do this right. Ten percent. I okay. Look, I can't figure out the math on this one. But I tried to make it simpler for you guys. And I had the whole analogy earlier and lost it in my damn head because I didn't write it in my notes. Bear with me. All right. 10% of the households in America own and have 69% of the household wealth in this country. Right? 10% of the households hold 69% of the household wealth. The bottom 50% of the country hold 2.5% of the wealth. That's what I'm trying to explain to you folks. The wage gap is significant. Not only that, it's significant in the Black and Hispanic communities as well, where Black and Hispanic families own 24 cents for every dollar of the white family wealth. 
part of that is because, you know, I brought it up in the last segment. Slavery had something to do with it. Then after slavery, you had Reconstruction, you had Jim Crow, you had redlining that lasted into the 80s. There was a concerted effort of the wealthy to maintain wealth, and the wealthy were majority white families. Every now and then, somebody would grab a little bit of the American dream, but it's, it's, it's rare. It's rare, right? So when white families have three, four, five, six generation head start, you're going to have a, a, a wealth gap that is black and Latino families having 24 cents for every dollar white families. On top of that, there's resources, right? Uh, the lack of resources in, in the black and Latino community, certain things as simple as Head Start. I have a lot of friends who have kids. I have a lot of friends who explain to me the cost of putting their kids into preschools, not daycare, preschools. The fact of the matter is a lot of these children that are going into these preschools know their numbers and can read before they even start kindergarten. Now, imagine that, compare that to kids that are walking into kindergarten, didn't have preschool. If they don't have parents that know how to teach kids how to read and count, they're walking into kindergarten not knowing how to read, not knowing how to write. And hell, isn't that what kindergarten is for? But they're already behind. Those are resources that I'm talking about. So if you hold the majority of the wealth, you have more recess resources and access to progress the next generation ahead. I say all that to say this. I still believe capitalism is the way to go. I also think that a little bit more control over the golden eggs, as, as Warren Buffett would say, it, the money could be better distributed throughout working and lower class families. How can that be done? Well, a, a federal minimum wage uh, would, would help. $15 ain't cutting it. $15 an hour is not going to cut it. It'd be more like $25 an hour. And I know what a lot of people are going to say. You're going to drive a lot of businesses out of uh, business because they can't afford to get the, the workers at. That's capitalism, right? If you can't, If you can't afford to pay working wages, then you don't own a company. You're not an entrepreneur. I'm sorry. That's not a right. It, it's, a, it's a privilege. It is a privilege to live, try to live the American dream and be an entrepreneur. And there are a lot of ways that you can be successful in this country being an entrepreneur. There's a lot of programs, but one, you have to have a business sense. That's first and foremost. Uh, I'm helping a friend right now help get their business on track. Uh, that's one of the side things that I do. I'm a consultant to, to help people with their businesses. I have already built their website. Uh, I'm updating their website and giving them more ideas for marketing and uh, expanding their, their, their company and basically operations, right? That that's, that's what I'm really, really good at is operations. And this person really doesn't have a business sense because a lot of things that I tell them, I think is common sense. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's a business professor and they said, yeah, a lot of that is common sense. Also, people don't know business, right? There's so many people out there that want to start a restaurant or want to start a bar, not realizing that the majority of restaurants and bars fail. It, it seems nice to start something like that. But the majority of them fail. A friend of mine started a house cleaning business, thriving. And when he said to me, hey, this is, this is what I'm going to do, I said, that's an excellent business to get into because there's a lot of people. There's a lot of wealth in this area. And there's a lot of people that don't have the time or don't necessarily want to clean their apartments and their homes. And they will hire people to do that. You just got to find the right marketing, find the right market. Uh, get a couple of clients, have them give you referrals and boom, there you go. And it's successful. So that was a smart business, right? To get into. If you're trying to get into some, if you're trying to get into podcasting <laughs> to make money, is there money to be made in it? Yes. But is everybody going to make money in it? No. And it takes a lot of work and you can't just turn on the mic and start going. Sometimes that is what I do. I turn on the mic and start going. 
not blindly. I never turn on the mic, mic and start going without a plan. I deviate from the plan because as my sister says, I have ADHD, but I don't believe that's the case. But like there, there takes planning and all this stuff that goes along in creating a podcast. And you see so many people start a podcast, do it a couple episodes and then fail because they don't really know what to talk about. Just because you're good at talking with your friends doesn't mean that you can get on the mic and talk. And I will honestly admit, I'm not the best podcaster. I didn't jump into this thinking I was going to be the best podcaster. I know that I am getting better at podcasting. I'm getting better at talking, despite the fact that I, you know, I flub up some words time to time. But, you know, I'm getting better at this. I'm going to be better this time next year than I am now. I know that because I work at this. You had to work at it. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to be successful. I know I'm going to be successful because I know me um, and I tend to keep pushing until I reach a goal. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, when you start something that's going to be successful, that doesn't necessarily mean that just because somebody else is successful at something that you're going to be successful at something. Entrepreneurship is not a right. It's a privilege. And so if you can't pay a living wage, if I hire people to start doing all the post-production and I can't pay them, then I need to do it myself or I don't really have a company or a business. So, and that's capitalism, right? That's capitalism. You know, uh, me and my sister were talking about Kmart in one of the episodes and how Walmart and Target and all these big box companies have put mom and pops and even big box companies like Kmart that use exist out of business. That's kind of what happens. The government's job is to make sure there isn't a monopoly. You have to make sure there isn't a monopoly because that's how all the wealth gets attained by one particular group and gets held on. And you see that right now at Walmart, they don't they don't try to give their people full hour, I mean full time hours and, and, and benefits and things of that nature to keep costs down. And then you know who the largest supplier in the South is? Besides the US government. The US government is the larger supplier of employment in the South. Aside from the government, independent private. Walmart. So that's capitalism. And I have a client that has a, a nephew that works for Target and doesn't have a college education, graduated from high school. They have no options. Uh, there is no chance that they will be able to sustain a life by themselves working for Target. This person can't even get full time hours, right? You're going to have to work multiple jobs. Um, and why is that? Because there's no minimum wage. There's no federal minimum wage. So you're going to have wage gap disparity until you, at very least, try to level the playing ground so that people can have a, a, a working wage. And that's the is issue that Gen Z is having. They're coming out of here with so much debt in college that the, the employment um, unemployment is, is low, but the employment options, you know, there's a lot of people out there who've got two or three jobs and having to do a side hustle. And even Warren Buffett said, hey, look, I don't, you know, it's great if you have a, a side hustle, but like you really shouldn't have to have to have a side hustle to be able to support yourself or your family in this country. So I say all that to say this, Gen Z, keep your head up. You'll make it because y'all have the greatest entrepreneurial spirit I have ever seen. Believe in yourself, you will get there. Realize that most people, even even the boomers, didn't really get to financial security until their forties. Uh, that's true. Like I, like I'm I've been there, but kind of not been there throughout my thirties and forties. And like you know, you're there now, uh, but I'm forty three years old. So part of that is just you know adult life. Uh, try to manage your debt the best you can. Uh, don't be materialistic and buy things that you don't need. Stack your money. In the words of my uncle, my late great uncle, make your money, save your money. And hopefully things will turn around for this younger generation so they can attain what they want to uh, attain. But I'll be honest, it's really tough out here for the millennials as well. Like it's really tough out here for the millennials as well. Um, but keep your head up. What, you know, I, I always like to end off on, on something funny. So here it is. I, I, I don't know if this would be funny, but I thought this was interesting. So another one of my friends thinks for some reason I'm good at budgets and, and things of that nature, which, by the way, I am not. In my personal life, I have a very big spending problem, right? Um, I spend money. 
Uh, I make money, I spend money. I, I, sometimes I don't listen to what my uncle told me. I make money and spend money instead of make my money, save my money. But uh, t- this person has, has asked me to go over their personal finances. This isn't the per- first time that I've done this for people and kind of create a budget for them, a personal budget for them. Uh, and I went through their personal finances and I said, well, you'll save a lot of money by just doing this. And they said, what? I said, what are, what is the two things that you absolutely got to have? They said, face products and hair products. I said, okay, where well, the majority of your money is going to face hair, uh, rent, your, your exercising, right. and then water, not water bill, water. I said, how much money do you think you're spending a month on water? Like, I don't know. I said, every time that I see you, you have like at least two waters on you. Maybe you buy in bulk. Maybe you go to Costco and you buy in bulk. But how often do you stop at the grocery store or 7-Eleven and and buy water? I said, let's say that you go to the grocery store or 7-Eleven, buy water. Let's say it's two for $3, right? So you're spending $3 every 30 days, sometimes 31 days, at least $3. That right there is $90 to $100 a month, depending on how many bottles of water that you get. That right there. I said, also, you don't have a grocery budget. You pretty much know what you're going to spend on groceries each month. Let's do that. Uh, so the story, this funny the thing about the story was just going over her budget, and we all do this. We all have this wasteful money because it's so much easier now that we don't use cash to just use our card. And the next thing you know, you look, you go and you log into your your bank account, you know, through your app, through your phone and be like, how did how did where did all that money go? All that money went you spending it on little stuff, going to get that water and and, and going to get that Gatorade. For me, it's Gatorade, uh, Gatorade Zero, by the way. Um, <laughs> and so I'm going through. And I was like, you could save a lot of money just by getting you a Brita. A Brita and and a and a and a the water you know water goodness gracious I can't even not a water cooler um mm, lost my train of thought y'all know what I'm talking about there you know the stuff that you put water in you carry it all around yeah uh, somebody out there is gonna be like Bruce it's this and yes I'm losing my train of thought because I've been talking for the last two hours and uh, I'm starting to ramble a little bit so that just tells me it's time to end this show so. Um, I want to thank you again for listening and watching. I also, once again, check out our merch store. The holidays are here. Uh, I will be putting up sweatshirts on there by the end of this week. Uh, there will be sweatshirts and t-shirts that you can buy. And, and during the Christmas break, uh, when we take a little hiatus, I'll be adding more goodies to, to that uh, to that merch store. So go ahead and get some merch out there for you people uh, for the holidays, getting for you free gifts. And uh, once again, you know, share like comment review all that good stuff um once again thank you for watching thank you for listening i hope you learned a little something here uh, until next time as always i'll holla Whew. that was a hell of a show thank you for rocking with us here on unsolicited perspectives with bruce anthony now before you go don't forget to follow subscribe like comment and share our podcast wherever you're listening or watching it to it pass it along to your friends if you enjoy it that means the people that you rock will will enjoy it also so share the wealth share the knowledge share the noise and for all those people that say well i don't have a youtube if you have a gmail account you have a youtube subscribe to our youtube channel where you can actually watch our video podcast but the real party is on our patreon page after hours uncensored and talking straight ish after hours uncensored is another show with my sister and once again the key word there is uncensored those are exclusively on our patreon page jump onto our website at unsolicitedperspective.com for all things us that's where you can get all of our audio video our blogs and even buy our merch and if you really feel ingenuous and want to help us out you can donate on our donations page donations go strictly to improving our software and hardware so we can keep giving you guys good content that you can clearly listen to and that you can clearly see so any donation would be appreciative most importantly i want to say thank you thank you thank you for listening and watching and supporting us and i'll catch you next time audi 5000 peace